somebody who's constantly going to the gym and they're working out and they're building their muscles and we're getting that kind of power. You know, the kind that we can intimidate go, Ugh! You make fun of they have all the muscles bulging, bulging. Well, spiritually we can be that way as well. The book of Romans talks about uh, that the spirit and the flesh are constantly warring. And we can either feed one and let the other starve, or we can put the spiritual man. And that's what we're talking about, is building up that spiritual man, becoming strong in Christ, becoming strong spiritually, becoming strong in faith, the gifts of the Spirit. We'll be talking about um, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and becoming strong spiritually. But before we become strong spiritually, we begin talking about faith. Because faith is where all begins. It takes faith to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. It takes faith walking forward every day knowing that if I confess my sins and accept Him as my personal Savior, going forward, as long as I'm not doing contrary to the Word of God, as long as I'm not sinning, and if I mess up, I'm asking for forgiveness, pushing aside, and keep trucking forward. As long as I'm doing those things, I can go forward in faith knowing that one day my home is going to be in heaven. It's not something that I'm going to feel on an everyday basis, brother Eli. I'm not going to feel God is going to be just every day. You're on your way to heaven. You're on your way to heaven. And I'm not going to feel that in my spirit every day. I'm not going to feel that physically. But I'm going to know. And by faith, I'm going to keep going forward. So it all begins with faith. Someone said, faith is not hoping God can. It is knowing that he will. Last week we talked about faithful, uh, following faith, where we looked at examples of faith. We looked at that famous book, of Paul of Faith, there in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And in there is a record of men and women who walk by faith. Amen. And we're just, what's that, brother? Uh, Okay, that's good, brother. I'll take the amen when I get it. Amen. But we're going to go back and we're going to take a look at it. Why? Because before we are going to really step out, before we're going to apply it to our lives, it needs to mean something to us. We have to take it to heart that I'm going to do everything I can to grow in faith. Or I'm going to do everything I can to draw closer to God. It takes effort on our part. It doesn't always just come naturally. But when we look at Abel in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and verse 4, Hebrews 11 and verse 4, if someone would please read that. Hebrews 11 and verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more acceptable, excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that. Now, if we were to go, to go back to the time of Abel, did he have the Bible there with him every single day? No. He did not have the book of Hebrews. He did not have the writings of Paul. He didn't have the writing of apostles. So what did he have? Maybe it was a written down brother. Maybe it was. I won't deny that. But we don't know. But what we do know is that it was passed down verbally because when we look at the book of Genesis back in chapter 3, what happened? The snake came. He deceived Eve. God kicked him out of the garden. But then I think it's in chapter 4 where God reveals to them that there has to be a sacrifice for sin. There has to be a blood atonement. And he made them those coats out of animal skin. And from the very beginning, they knew what was required to have their sins covered. What They knew what God required of them. So going forward, they knew that there had to be a sin sacrifice. They knew that it had to be a blood sacrifice. They might not have had the scripture saying, this is the way it is. They might not have had it written down. But they knew. Because God showed them. And I'm sure God told them. God informed them. Because God informs all of us what he requires. 
And there, what do we find Cain doing? He's offering up fruits and vegetables. Is that what God required? No. He wanted a blood sacrifice. And without having the Bible or possibly anything written, Abel went out year after year or whatever God required of them and offered that sacrifice. And he didn't do it because it was something written down and it wasn't something that maybe he felt that he had to do. He and when I say felt, he didn't physically feel God saying, today you need to offer me a sacrifice. Or the Holy Ghost prodding him in one direction. But he knew what God required it. He knew when God required it. And therefore, by faith, he stepped out, offered up that sacrifice. If we were to put our place in Abel, put us in Abel's shoes, would we have done that? Going on just the Word of God. Now, we don't always feel the Word of God. We don't always feel the Holy Ghost prodding us in one direction. But by faith, Abel stepped out that by offering that sacrifice, his sins would be covered. If we move on to Enoch, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5, and put ourselves in his shoes. Hebrews 11 and verse 5. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God hath translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. When we look at the time of Enoch, if you were living there, would you have had the Bible? No. The Bible wasn't written yet. There were no written manuscripts as far as scripture, as far as we know. They didn't come until after Enoch. But Enoch walked with God, and he talked with God. I'm sure he heard God's voice. He knew what it was. And whatever it was, we know that Enoch, by faith, was translated. I can only imagine, we don't know how Enoch knew this revelation. Whether he just felt it within his spirit, or if God told him. But can you imagine, by faith he walked with God. No other man before had ever been translated. What do we mean, mean by translated? His body was changed that it never saw death. We would probably refer to it as the new glorified body that we're going to receive at the rapture. But it was never done before. And if you were, you know, walking with God, what would you think if God told you one day, you know what, Enoch, you, know, you are never going to die. Don't worry about death. You're never going to see it. Would you take God at his word, believing it, that, you know what, as the years, maybe Enoch knew this early on in his life. You know, there's been things I know about my life since I was the age of 10. I knew how God was directing me. Things that he wanted me to do in the future. May not accomplish them yet, but by faith I'm going forward knowing that they're coming. Can you imagine being 10 years old, and let's just say, for the sake of Enoch was 10 years old, and God told him, you know what, Enoch, you're never going to die. But you reach age 20, age 30, age 40, age 100 maybe, because they lived a long time back then. Adam lived to be, what, 960 or something like that? 969. 969. So, what Adam lived up? Methuselah. Methuselah. But still, people lived to be a long age back then. Can you imagine reaching 300? God said, I'm never going to die, but yet, your, front, your physical body is still aging. 365 years old. 365. So your body is still aging. It's still changing. It's still maybe getting wrinkles. You're still losing your hair. Maybe you have no hair by this point. But God said, you're never going to die. Would you still by faith keep believing? The Bible says that it was by faith that he was translated, that he never saw death, that he received his glorified body. If we put ourselves in his shoes, would we have the same faith, knowing that this is what God said? No matter how long ago it was, this is what God said. I'm just going to keep drawing close to him. This is only going to keep drawing close to him. No matter how much Arthur showed up, no matter how much pain he might have got when he got out of bed, God said, I'm never going to die. God said, I'm never going to die. He hung to that. Whatever age he was, when God told him that, or the Spirit revealed it to him, he clung by faith, knowing that he would not see death. Or what about if we placed ourselves in Noah's shoes? 
would we still have faith? In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, which if you haven't noticed, we're going to be spending some time in the book of Hebrews 11 tonight. But Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith Noah being warned of God things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. How many times did God tell Noah that the flood was coming? Or what he had to do? I mean, we don't know. Maybe he, God told him and reminded him, assured him several times, because if we were to be honest, there have been times probably in our own life that God told us something, and we believed it, but we had to find ourselves at the altar again, and God had to reassure us that it was true, and it's going to come again. But sometimes he only tells us something once. And sometimes it's not very long, it's just passing. Maybe it was just Noah, you need to go to Ark, collect two of each creature, seven of the uh, clean, two of the unclean, and you need to build an Ark, this is how you need to build it. Maybe that's all Noah ever heard. If you were Noah, and that's all you ever heard, would you by faith build that Ark? Or a better question is, if you were Noah, would you by faith keep building the Ark? You know, sometimes people take the Word of God and they step out. But they keep going to a degree. And then the devil comes along and he discourages them. And then they begin to doubt, did God really tell me this? Is this right really going to happen? I mean, you got to think about, put yourself in Noah's mindset in his day. Rain never came from the air before. It never came from the air. It always came from the ground. But there's going to be a flood and there's going to be rain. Did they have boats back then? Maybe they did. But maybe they weren't on such a large scale as ever before because maybe there was no need to. Maybe the earth was all one piece of land. So there was no need to make a big boat and go from uh, the North America to England and so forth. I don't know what it was like. But putting ourselves in Noah's mindset, he's building this big old ark to house seven of all the clean creatures, Seven pairs of each one. Uh, two of each of the, of the unclean. And he's going to house them in this boat. And he's getting food. And he's getting straw. And his family. There's only one door. One window. And he's going on the word of God. Like I said, maybe God didn't tell him over and over. Maybe God didn't reassure him every 20 years that he's on the right path. Maybe God only told him once. What do we know about Noah, though? By faith, he built the ark, preparing for the flood. 120 years. 120 years. If we were in Noah's shoes, would we have faith that strong? To build an ark, like no one's ever seen before, and to prepare for a flood that has never happened before, to prepare for water coming from the sky, which has never happened before, you know what would happen if we told somebody that something was going to happen naturally that never happened before? And we kept insisting upon it. And not insisting upon it, but kept working towards it. They'd probably show up with a crazy wagon to get us ready to be hauled away. But by faith, Noah persisted and he built the ark. And he constantly warned him. If he had one word from God, that was all that he needed. If that was us, would we have had enough faith like Noah to keep going forward? Or we can talk about Abraham in chapter in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10. Where it states, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And when he went out not knowing whether he went, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker was God. When we look at Abraham, by faith he went out looking for a city whose foundations were made by God himself. 
and he kept looking, and he kept moving on, and he kept walking forward. And it wasn't just a promise that God said wherever his feet would touch, that would be his inheritance and his. But he kept looking for that city. He had his eyes set on God. And the scripture states, by faith, he kept looking. If we were in Abraham's shoes, would we have that much faith to keep looking for the city of God? People rise up against us. They kidnap our, kidnap our nephew. We have to go save him. God, is your promise so true? Would we keep the faith? Enemies rise up. Would we keep the faith? Keep looking for that city. God, I don't see it, but I'm still looking. Would we have that much faith? And when we look at the life of Abraham, he never found that city in his lifetime. Because it wasn't on this earth. The city which Abraham looked for wasn't on this earth. And when he died, I don't know what he thought when he went down into paradise. He still didn't find that city. But that city didn't start being built until after Christ went back to heaven. It existed. But Abraham never saw it. But yet by faith, he kept looking. If we were Abraham, would we have kept looking for the city of God? Would we have kept looking for that city that we knew that God laid the foundation of? You know, sometimes we lose faith after God tells us something in this lifetime and we go a short way. It's not even been a year, but God is His promise true. But they kept looking. Abraham kept looking. Or what about in chapter in 17 through 19, verses 17 and 19 of Hebrews 11? This one takes even more faith. Than you. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Counting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he figured him in a figure. So we were to place ourselves in Abraham's shoes once again. God gave us a son in our old age. Old age, give him a heart. And he said that all of Abraham's inheritance would be passed on through Isaac. Not Ishmael, Isaac. And Abraham didn't have any other children. But God comes to you one day and tells you, you know what, Abraham? I want you to offer up Isaac to me. That one that I promised you that your inheritance would come from, uh, be passed through. I want you to offer him up for me. What would go through your mind? What would you think? God, you want me to kill my only son? I don't think Sarah can handle another one. She's had this one in her old age. I don't think she's going to handle another pregnancy. Or, if he goes, there goes my entire inheritance. Everything that God has given me, wiped out. There's nothing else. God said it would come for him. If there's no Isaac, then there's nothing to be passed on for me. But what does the book of Hebrews inform us about the faith of Abraham? He had that much faith. God said that my inheritance would be passed on through Isaac. It would be. And he said him specifically. So if God said that my inheritance will be passed on through Isaac, if I kill him, God's going to have to raise him from the dead because he promised me that my inheritance would be passed on through him. Would we have that much faith to believe God? That God can do exceedingly and abundantly above anything we could ever imagine? Will we not limit God when God says to offer up the one thing that he said would, our spiritual inheritance would be passed on through? If he said, give away, get rid of that one thing that I've already promised you, would we have enough faith that God would restore it back to the way it was? Because that's what he said in the first place. 
And God is not man that he should be a liar. So if God said, my inheritance is going to be passed on through Isaac, he's just going to have to raise him from the dead. God's not a liar. He said it's going to happen. He's going to have to bring him back to life. So if he wants me to offer him up for a sacrifice, hey, I'll do it. But he better bring him back. He's got to bring him back. But even better than that, Abraham said, he will bring him back. And the book of Hebrew tells us that by faith, Abraham believed that God was faithful, even to the point of bringing the dead back to life. Or what about Joseph? In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandments concerning his bones. Now God gave a prophecy that the children of Israel would be in bondage in Egypt for 500 years. And Joseph took that word and held it to heart. Because really, where else could he have gotten it? Yes, God could have told him. But what if the only thing that Joseph ever had to go on was the promise that God gave Abraham years and years ago, that they would come into bondage, but God would deliver them? What if that's all he had? What if Joseph never felt the prodding of the Holy Ghost in that direction? What if Joseph never heard the voice of God saying, one day I'm going to deliver these people out of Egypt, and they'll go back to their homeland that I had already promised them? What if all he had was either verbal, uh, the promises of God passed down orally, or maybe written down somewhere? What if that's all he said, had? But he clung to it by faith. And before even the birth of Moses, Joseph said, you know, there's coming a day when we're going to leave this place. Don't you dare leave my body behind. You take it with me. When you leave this place, you take my bones and you bury them over there in Shechem. Don't leave me in this heathen land. By faith, Joseph instructed for his body to be taken from Egypt when they departed. Would we have had that much faith if we were Joseph? Think about it. Like I said, he may not have had anything verbally ever told to him by God. Maybe all he had was either the promise of God ran down, passed down, maybe from Isaac or Jacob. And that's all he had to go on. But he believed it by faith enough to say so much and instruct. When, you, when the time comes and you leave, don't you dare leave my body here. You take it back home. If we were Joseph, would we have that much faith? C.H. Charles Spurgeon said this, Faith obliterates time, annihilates distance, and brings future things at once into its possession. Let me read that again. Faith obliterates time, annihilates distance, and brings future things at once into its possession. possession. Faith sees beyond the natural sees into the spiritual and goes forward even when it doesn't seem possible. When we look at the book of Hebrews, that's exactly what these men and women of God did. They looked beyond the current situation, clung to the word of God, and went forward knowing what God said was true. Whether it was passed down from somebody hundreds of years ago, or whether God spoke to them definitively. Excuse me, definitively. You fear and for all those years, and to, and to think that they remembered about Joseph, what he said, because it was 430 years that they were in Egypt. And you think, after all that time, that they remember what Joseph had said. Absolutely. And to be honest, brother, for all we know, and I'm probably taking this way off the wall and exaggerating a little bit, but for all we know, Joseph 
clung to the Word of God so strongly that when it came to his sarcophagus, his tomb, if he would have had a pyramid, whatever it would have been, I don't know if he would have had the uh, edge on the outside of it. Do not leave my body here, or take my body with you, or when you leave, take me with you. I mean, something that bold, that strongly, that every time you walk by, when we get out of here, we gotta take Joseph. When we get walk by Joseph's tomb, Joseph says, "Don't forget about me. We gotta take him with us if we ever go." You know, something that bold it might not just been word, but maybe it was just something etched out there that everybody could deny. Because the thing is, brother, when it comes to Christianity, what do we tell people? Jesus will come back any moment. You gotta get ready. It's not something that we keep to ourselves, but Jesus is coming back. You've got to get ready. It's not something that we might push away, tuck away, but we make sure that people know. I can't help but wonder if Joseph made sure that everybody tried, every time somebody walked by the tomb, they knew that his body was not to stay there. Well, I think we had sort of like a thing, you know, that they just put it in, and then they put it into the wall or something like that. Well, they did have a sarcophagus and a tomb, but... Some of the pharaohs, they had pyramids, and some of the tombs were decorative, and some were hidden. But like I said, that's just an exaggeration, but I can't help but even if Joseph took it a step farther and made sure that, don't leave me here, because he believed that strongly. Yeah. And maybe he did. But he believed, and when I say didn't, I mean he didn't go to that extreme. But he believed it that strongly. Don't leave me here. And they remember. And as we're all up here, you get a knife. That's a long time. That is a long time. Now when we look at faith, we've pointed out in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, we found the definition of faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Faith and hope in that verse are connected by one word, and that is substance. And we've already talked about the translation of that word substance that can be replaced with the word confidence. Not taking the Bible out of context, but every time we look at the word of faith in the Bible and hope, you always find confidence there. Never the word doubt, never doubting, never fretting, maybe not, and never, or maybe it'll happen, or maybe it won't, but a confidence that it will happen. There's no doubt that it's going to happen. That's what faith says. Faith is not hoping God can. It is knowing He will. So when we look at faith, if faith is taking God as word and saying, if this is what He said, it's going to happen. And sometimes it is a mind struggle for us. But there comes a point that we need to get control of our own minds and push doubt aside. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love of a sound mind. He's given us that sound mind. There's one person that likes to strike fear, and he likes to throw down into the Christian's land. And that's the devil. And when it comes to faith, we can't doubt. We just have to believe. And when we look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, that's exactly what we see as we go throughout the entire chapter. Men and women who by faith, they didn't doubt, but they said, this is what God said, and I'm going to keep going forward. Now, if we were to sit back and say, well, the devil never came against them and never tried to put down our life, we'd be fooling our own selves. Because the devil fights us tooth and nail. He really does. He does not want us to receive the inheritance of God. He does not want us to receive the blessings of God. Now, he's not going to fight us right when God tells us something. When somebody gets through at the altar,